Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. My guest today was a former artist at Bethesda on games such as Skyrim, Fallout 3, and Fallout 4. He has also worked on an awesome illustrated book, Marvel Anatomy, a scientific study of the superhuman, and has recently started a Kickstarter with his graphic novel, Quiet Level 1, that you can check out. I'll post the links in the description. I'd like to welcome Jonah Loeb. How are you doing? I'm very well. Thank you for having me on your show. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, hello to all the Kiwis and others who are listening right now. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, I was speaking about this before, but you've you've done a lot of interviews, so I've got to make sure that I switch this up for you, right? <laughs> sure. So, yep, you've got to be respectful of your time. So I'm going to start off with um, Aldo and the Dragon, right? Because this is the art that broke you, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, it is. can you walk me through that process and how it ended up breaking you? And like, were you aware of of how hard you were pushing yourself at the time, or what was the process? No. no. So, essentially, for anyone who doesn't know the the one sentence description, I gave myself tendonitis working on Aldo and the Dragon. So, yes. at that point, I've been working really hard on Skyrim for a while. Um, working at these desks, uh, kind of in the chairs where you kind of lean lean, lean back a lot. Um, you know, it's hard for me to envision working that way now because I'm, you know, old. And so trying to picture like how you're a body not that like, old. Yeah, but I'm old enough to know that you can't slouch while you're working. You have to maintain good posture or you're going to yes. suffer for it. So I was working on Alduin, uh, the world leader, the last boss of Skyrim. And it was based on the model of um, from the normal dragons, and we were using. Uh, I was kind of mod modding on top of it and building it anew. So I was using the same fundamental structure, but um, the concept art for Alduin, which was fantastic, was kind of pitted in black and that kind of thing. And the more I started thinking about Alduin, the world leader, and this kind of ent this dragon like entity with this almost sci fi tilt of it, like. I imagined it like hurtling through space, you know, hurtling, hurtling through the cosmos, you know, like looking for worlds to eat. Whether or not that was his lore that like appealed to me as a vision, you know, space dragon, you know. Um, and so I was looking at meteorites uh, for a reference and meteorites are iron and they are pitted full of little pits and divots. Um, and so the act of sculpting it took a long time and involved intense amounts of detail. And I was carving it all by hand, you know, um, doing everything by hand. And a dragon is a lot of surface area. They have, yeah. they have a lot of surface area to a dragon. They got some very big wings and um, really long tails. And even though this thing looked like a meteorite, he also had to have segments and individual plates and that kind of thing. And um, so it just, I was working really hard. I didn't realize how hard I was working. And my wrist started hurting. And then it got to the point where I was making the, the I was going from the high resolution detailed sculpt to the lower resolution game model. And I was trying to build the game model out. And so I went onto my mouse and I was just clicking, 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 dragging, double clicking, double clicking, clicking. And I was kind of behind schedule as I was want to do a lot back then. And, um, I just kept pushing myself to the point where I was really hurting. And eventually, you know, I, but I figured, okay, there's like four or five days of good work left and then I'm done with this. Um, so I just have to put in the time and then I can relax. And I just pushed myself, you know, the, for a couple of days. And then nearing the last day, I just hit a point where I was like, you know what? It's late at night. I, I need to get this done by tomorrow. I think I can get it done by tomorrow if I just hustle. But my, my wrist really, really hurts. So I'm going to lie down in the theater here at Bethesda because we had a little theater where we do team meetings and everything. I'll get a couple hours of shut eye on these seats. And then when I wake, I'll wake up before anybody else gets here. I'll go back up to my, my desk and I'll just put in three or four more hours and have this done by lunchtime, you know, and, and turn it in finally, you know, two weeks late. And I, I went back upstairs after I slept and I sat down on my computer and I touched my mouse and I was like, wow, I can't. I can't click. I can't click one more time. This is so bad. I and only then did I realize. Oh no, I've done something serious to myself. Hmm. And I ended up taking, I think, like something like three months of halftime. You know, two two weeks off entirely. And then for the next three weeks, three months, I got like a special provision just to work like work half the time, 
uh, and I was going to physical therapy and I just, and I was going to physical therapy like three times a week nearby and I just wasn't really getting better or rather I did get better, but it took me a long time to do. And that ended up being an injury that stuck with me for a while. I kind of beat it down for a while and then I left Bethesda and then moving up to New, moving up to New York, I found myself in a couple of years again in this position where it was unsustainable pain and it felt like it was just it just hurt really badly. And I've been going to physical therapy and all these things. And I just thought to myself, what, what is wrong with me? Like what I'm, I'm too young to feel this kind of like agony here. And I'm doing too much to try to prevent it. You know, I was, I was icing it on the regular, which helped a lot. And I was going to physical therapy, which seemed to help, but not very much. And ultimately it turned out to not be my wrist at all. I kind of figured out, which is another story that it was, my spine. And I, I went to a chiropractor, they took x-rays and they showed me that between two vertebra in my neck, which is where the nerves come out to the, that, that run down through your arms to the to your fingertips, between two particular vertebra, I had some undiagnosed whiplash. And essentially you could see even on the x-ray, there was arthritic buildup between two of the discs in my neck. And so what had happened basically is I had been pinching the nerves in my um, arm and which killed a great deal of strength in that arm. And when you don't, so then my other muscles, like my tendons in my wrist were overcompensating to try to make this work. So honestly, after a couple of weeks of going to the chiropractor, it went away and it's basically hasn't come back since if ever I feel oh, that that's good. Nerve, and I, yeah, exactly. And this all happened when I was like 27, I'm 41 now. And I've, I'm, I've got, you know, this, it's, it's not an issue. It's not an issue that, that has followed me. So if ever I feel that weird pain in my wrist, I just go to the chiropractor and then I'm better the next day. So, <laughs> so that's a long story, but that's, that's what happened. Aldo and the world leader destroyed me. Wow. Yeah, wow. Definitely. And I, I, cause I've seen a chiropractor as well for like problems in my neck. And mm -hmm. I remember the first time I went, they, they kind of grab your neck and they click it. And mm -hmm. it's really kind of, it throws you off, right? Because you feel like <laughs> you're kind of supposed to be dead. Like, cause yeah. it's so, it, it feels kind of violent how they do it. Oh, yeah. It yeah. Like, like, hit, like Hitman. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm, gl I'm glad that you're better now. Um, so oh, I suppose it's something too. you just keep aware of and like your, yes. your posture and everything while you're working. And yeah. Totally. I watch my posture. I just, I try to work out and make sure my core is strong. And I go to the chiropractor like once a month. Um, this, this, this guy, he's, he's, I've been to a couple of chiropract chiropractors, but this one is brilliant. So I'm really, I'm really into him. Yeah. Yeah. Are you aware yeah. of anyone else like that you've worked with that has had similar issues? Cause I imagine it, it could be a big problem with anybody in or well, who's working in front of a computer where you're leaning over or might be hunched a lot. I haven't had anybody have the exact same diagnosis, um, but I don't know how many people have tried. I mean, I had undiagnosed whiplash that like obviously I didn't, that had got untreated. But with that said, we work in an industry full of creative professionals who are at their computer all the time. And there's no doubt, that especially the ones who are having problems in their wrist, there is no doubt in my mind that those are at least partially attributable to the way they're sitting because uh, it can, you, can, you can really screw yourself, you know, yeah. by, by sitting strangely. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Now, I know uh, when you worked on Death Claw in Fallout 4, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. horns were slightly inspired by the Balrog from the Lord oh, yeah. of the Rings films. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I want to know, and this might sound cliche coming from a Kiwi person, but how much of maybe Skyrim or any other parts of Fallout were inspired by those films? Do you know? Um, or is it just you with the, the Death Claw? You know, I tend to pick up random random references as I go through life. Um, and so I think Lord of the Rings was certainly highly responsible for, you know, um, Skyrim, for sure. Um, you know, there's a lot of that Nordic influence. There's a lot of those like old ruins and strange monsters under the under the earth and things like that. You know, elves, dwarves, what have you. Um, but when it came to the Deathclaw, I was just trying to figure out an elegant way to... Um, integrate the, de the iconic Deathclaw horns into the silhouettes because um, the ways it had, it had been done before, it just didn't feel right to me. You know, the, the old pixelated version, it looked pretty cool and they had a unique kind of curve to them, but you know, they were based on that, the horns of a Jackson chameleon and it just didn't like 
totally worked for me. And then in my Fallout 3 version that I made, um, the horns there also were kind of thin and kind of, there's a, there's a, lot, a lot of elements of the Deathclaw in Fallout 3 are kind of skeletal. I was trying to create a feeling of foreboding and I wanted them to look scary. And so there's a lot of elements of them that are very creepy and skeletal. And, but the more I started thinking about uh, this perfect hunter killer hybrid that is the death law, I wanted, you know, there's something, the difference for me between three and four, among other differences in terms of, in terms of like evolutionarily, like more feasible looking, et cetera, et cetera, is also beauty. Is I think that because death claws are this kind of immortal facets of the fallout universe that are kind of like they are that they are the dragons of the fallout world yeah so you can have a creature with more hit points or this and that you know like the Meyer like queen whatever but ultimately the the commonly like you know the the, the dragon of the of the fallout world is the death claw so this for me it was important to give them a sense of beauty and i also like to do make things artwork that is iconic and iconic basically means you see it and you remember it it leaves an impression on you and a lot of that is conveyed with the by conveying a sense of personality that is uh, that makes an impact emotional impact on the audience and a lot of that also comes down to simplicity visual simplicity something that's not too dense and complex such that your mind kind of latches on to the essential forms shapes and colors and so when it came to the iconic death claw horns I tried to keep the same general shape and curve of them. You know, they kind of bow out and then kind of come in a little bit and, and then and then out again. But I really worked to fuse it into the skull shape altogether. So there is elements of the Balrog that is kind of like a like a like a ram, you know? And yeah. um I and I, I thought you know, and that's kind of that that's got that kind of like demonic satan satanic like feel, right? Like the you know, the four horned ram or whatever it is uh, and which makes sense because it was a demon but for me i wanted i was thinking more like balrog or like bull or something and i was just thinking like how do i make every inch of this thing a weapon like some kind of weapon and without making it redundant because it's not because it's not a demon right and so i don't want to make everything sharp and all these different little you know, like that's why even the plates on along this back these like this crest of plates it has is more like a stegosaurus. They're not spikes per se. They're more like skeletal plates kind of. And so I thought I really focused on creating a very simple silhouette to those horns and kind of forming them so that altogether, counting the top of the, the skull itself, which is very plated and thick, it forms kind of like a, like a ram, like a ram's head, but not even like a ram, but more like a bull kind of where I, you should be able to picture the, the very easy picture of the death club putting its head down and running forward full stop into something head first. Um, it's the same reason, for instance, I made the tail have all these bony plates in it, but no spikes per se, because I just feel like on a creature like the death Claw, it's redundant. This thing has like a seven foot wingspan with like, you know, like two foot claws, right? Like it doesn't need <laughs> more sharp claws and edges. That's even why like the teeth itself are not even that sharp. The teeth are not used for rending flesh. The teeth are used for just crushing bone, you know, uh, because at the, by the time it gets to the death claws mouth, like it's done, whatever it is, it's dead, you know, like, because it's been just completely eviscerated. Um, so yeah, so that was, so Balrog, uh, bull, uh, Balrog bull, um simplicity iconic yeah i wanted so i wanted to take something that was essentially part of the lore and legacy and look of the death law and really integrate it into a more cohesive shape that is kind of then imprinted on people's memory but you say iconic but how would you know it's iconic like because you're looking at it right you wouldn't know it's iconic because what makes it iconic is if other people like instantly click with it you're right. you're absolutely you're absolutely right. Um, except that, except that I have been studying uh -huh. the, the the I have been studying for many years. Uh, <laughs> what is it that what is it that makes things iconic? And I think that a lot of it does come down to those those two elements I just I just named a per a, a personality a personality that seems that feels believable that feels real that you see it and it sees you and you immediately understand its intentions. You know, uh, and you and it and it makes an emotional connection. That's half of it. 
But the iconic element really does come down to a very simple and recognizable um, aesthetic. You know, so for instance, there are lots of kaiju in movies, right? Yes. But a Pacific Rim kaiju is unmistakable from any other one. And that is because they have, they all have, they all share a similar set of characteristics large external formations on their head or their shoulders, whatever, like almost like hatchets or battle axes or swords or whatever, kind of built into their body. They have these large gray hides, kind of vaguely reptilian in nature. You rarely get like a, a monkey version of a of a kaiju, except for when you do, it's plated, right? Like the gorilla looking one. But ultimately what makes them iconic are the designs, the glowing patterns and designs that cover their body. These make the kaiju from Pacific Rim, unlike anything else and completely unmistakable from anything else in the same way that the um, alien or the xenomorph, it's essentially, it's all black. It's, it's got a crazy looking uh, silhouette with these pipes on its back and the long, long head and all that. And the mouth within a mouth these things make it utterly distinctive from anything else. And so I have made lots of things using a lot of the same techniques that I hope to be iconic. And some of them hit harder than others. The super mutants, for instance, I love my work on the super mutants for fallout four. They don't get a lot of love. You know, people don't usually do fan art for them. They don't really jump to the top of the list of anyone's favorite work. I love them. I'm obsessed with them. It is what it is. But with something like the death claw, I worked really hard on that. And I think, I think focusing on when I say also the beauty of it, I don't mean the, oh, it's so pretty like a cat, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But do you know that like the tiger, tiger burning bright in the dark, in the darkness of the night, what, what immortal hand or eye could frame its fearful symmetry or something like that? I, I like that poem, except it drives me nuts because it doesn't rhyme at the end there. Um, <laughs> but the, the fearful symmetry, I think is kind of important where, um, Symmetry is is in many ways the root of attraction. The underlying current of like, does a person look good or not? The objective measure of that, the most easy objective measure, measure of that is how symmetrical is their face? It seems strange, but that's often a, a, a denoter of beauty. So there's something, if you can create bold, dramatic <clears throat> lines and forms and kind of that, that really kind of balance well with each other, and that's 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 kind of one of those things that you learn over time, like working on an asset and working on sculpture, et cetera. Um, then it kind of burns and in, burns into people's minds um, when you, especially when you couple that with an emotional connection. So, in answer to your question, yeah, like like it's not for me to say it's iconic, but but I've I, it, it's it's a form. The death claw is a form I've worked with enough and have studied enough to kind of have gotten to the root. I feel of like what makes those particular forms really feel, I don't know, maximized, you know, like, like, so for instance, and this will be my last example, because I know I'm going on and on, That's but you right. asked me about, this is fun. you asked me about <laughs> creature, creature design. This is yeah. my jam. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in creating like the horn layout that is integrated into the skull, I was trying to focus on the large lines of the, of the head. So like, like the really, like the, so you could take with your finger and follow with your finger. You could draw a path across from one tip of the horn, all the way around the horn, across the head and around to the other horn, very easily using very little wiggles and marks. So the power of that, of that simplicity and the balance of those lines, you know, the, the death claws got a lot of scales and wrinkles and veins and plates and that kind of thing. But really from my perspective, it's composed of very complete and very pleasing curves, lines, and straight lines. Um, and it's designed to, to to work that way. So when I draw, you can take a look at the death claw from any different angle and kind of draw a line down across one crease in the neck. And it will invariably hook into a plate on the side of the shoulder that, that swirls around to the back of the shoulder that then comes around to the front. You can follow these lines across the whole thing. Um, in a kind of a sinuous manner. So I guess this is all this is all my way of saying this is how I, I this is how artists can bestow beauty on the terrible is mm. creating this this 
completed line form and and structure i think it, it yeah and then when those things become irregular and mismatched and imbalanced then things start really deviating into like the truly ugly and that could be that could be very useful if you want to create something repulsive you know um yeah yeah i don't know i don't know if any of that makes sense but no, there you no, go no, this no, is how, it makes, it makes welcome sense. to the makes, inside of my head <laughs> yeah 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 well this is why you are who you are right um <laughs> But can you watch a film or play a game and just enjoy it for what it is? Or do you put on your hat and start looking at it and be like, oh, that's not iconic. Or, oh, they should have done this. <laughs> um, yeah, I do sometimes. O only if it's, it, it works it's a, It works both ways. If it's if I see a whole bunch of missed opportunities, I get angry. Because then I'm like, come on, <laughs> like millions were spent on this thing. And, you, and you're, you're, you're making these really silly choices where there was, really so much room to do cool things you know give me an example um Can you give i'll you give you an example, example. Yeah. yeah um i saw i saw bits and pieces I, maybe i saw the movie i can't really remember because it was totally forgettable but aquaman oh, and yeah. and they have which is you know of course it's an inherently like rather silly premise of these people you know these like atlanteans living under underwater blah 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 um I remember one particular scene where the bad guys are facing off against the good guys. And of course the good guys have dolphins and seahorses and the bad guys have sharks and things like that. And the, I remember the bad guys riding these sharks and these sharks like kind of like, they're kind of pulled back on the reins and the sharks are kind of like lunging and snarling and, you know, like acting really fearsome and evil. And I thought to myself, absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. There is nothing shark-like about that. That is a dog. That is not shark-like. And what they're doing is they're subverting the opportunity to make sharks fucking scary. Right. If they just had those, if they had one side, the seahorse and dolphins and all that kind of bucking and jittering, the prancing like ponies, whatever. And then you had the sharks just hanging there in the water with their hungry mouths, not snarling, not showing emotion, just have their mouths open and, and like gray gums with just teeth hanging there. That would have been cool. So lots of the tiny moments where that, where I'm like, I'm like, if you just thought about this a little bit more and instead of trying to impose like your vision on it, like let it do its thing. Yeah. Part, sometimes that drives me nuts, honestly, because it, because it just seems like a missed opportunity. And then sometimes, and I see this a lot actually, because there's been a lot of great movies recently. I just sit back and wonder, and I know what they're doing and I love it. You know, I'm like, Oh, I see what you're doing. Like, you know, the design for the, um, the sandworms in dune i mean yeah. mwah. i mean mwah. like they, like there's so many ways you could do a sandworm and everybody wants to do a sandworm but they look like giant they they're baleen they're baleen like whales which makes sense and they look when they rear up and open their mouth they look like a giant human eye i mean that's iconic that's iconic. You just nailed it. You just nailed it because what you've also done here is you've taken the, the sandworm, which yes, it's an animal, but on the other hand, it's Shai Hulud. It's like a spiritual part of Doom the planet. Like it is a godlike entity. It is the the defend it is not just the defender of spice. It is made possible by spice. It's a mag it's almost a magical entity, right? It's 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 a biblical in nature and scope. So the fact that it's a giant human eye is just brilliant you know or i watch uh across the spider-verse and i see oh there's like compositors there's three 3d animators there's there's graphic artists everyone's working on this thing and i think to myself every moment of this movie is perfect it's perfect it's like thought out to a t every moment of every shot is thought out to a t the the dialogue is like tight it's funny and it's as twitchy as a spider. You know, it's, a, it's just the whole thing. Like every Spider-Man you meet in that movie is funny. Why? Because Spider-Man is always funny. Yeah. Um, and it's just, so yeah, it, I, I definitely like worked hard to like cultivate like a like a critical eye because, you know, I just, I, I believe it's important to like try to be critical with about a lot of media out there because a lot of companies just want to spoon feed you crap, you know, and a lot of it is just derivative. But when I see things that are original, I derive like a real deep human pleasure mm. uh, where I'm just like, bless, bless you, bless <laughs> you. Like this is a gift to us all. Yeah. Fair enough. Did you always um, get enough time? Like obviously with any character that you're working on or any piece of art, say when you're at Bethesda, like I'm guessing you always had tight deadlines, but like how, how much time would it take you to just do one iteration? Because I imagine you did multiple iterations as well. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say I was always given enough time. We were always in a rush, obviously. Um, yeah. And I think some people were pushed harder than others. I think I was not pushed as hard as most people because I think I worked, I worked, you know, I was not the most technologically savvy individual there. I wasn't doing, you know, inventing new things and taking risks in any kind of big way like some people were. But I was doubling down or tripling down on just my artistic ability. And I think that I was given the privilege while I was there of designing a lot of the creatures there. And if you're a character artist, that means you love doing creatures by by default. But I kind of, by, by virtue of having kind of learned some technologies sooner than others, um, ZBrush mostly, and um, kind of specializing in it early in my career, I was given a lot of creatures. And it became, you know, the more you do you do a thing, the better you, you are at that thing. And so I kind of just got to be that guy, um, which was amazing. Um, and creatures take a while, you know, and they, and they take, I think the average creature would take me a month to, to sculpt and model and, and texture. And, uh, but I, which, and, and so I, I, I was definitely always hurried, hurried along and I was always kind of a little bit behind, but I think I was given a more leeway than most because I think the creatures are such kind of so important to kind of get right, you know, because the players fighting them, you know? So I think, even when I drove my poor producer crazy, you know, Angela, if you're listening, I'm really sorry. I love, I love Angela. She's like, she was the best producer. Um, but she had to develop a certain patience with me. And like, she kind of, I think she understood that I got, I was given by default. Like if I was, as long as I was doing things that people loved, nobody was going to come on me, come down on me too hard, except for her. And she was like, damn it, Jonah, <laughs> like this is, you're making my job hard. Um, but I tried and I, and I learned a lot from her and I learned a lot about the production process in just learning how to finish and move on. You know, um, that's another thing I learned while I was there is not everything has to be perfect because people are not really going to notice, you know, little, little, it, it, you know, you make up your mind about a thing or assets or a creature or whatever, really, really quickly. And the details from there are just gravy. So would you submit like say a piece of art to your lead and then they'd be like, nope, go back and fix it or anything? Would that happen often? Um yeah, they, they would want fixes, they want they would want changes for sure. Um, but I wasn't working in the dark for the most part. I was working on the concept art of uh I was working off concept art, and so um that would help a great deal. And I often would take chances and sometimes they would like, you know, in, in, I'd take chances in terms of I would change something. Um um, because in my mind, I was like, all right, well, the concept art is just the beginning of the process. I think that's where we start. And like, yes, the concept artist will often work with the art director to generate like something ideal, but they won't always necessarily get there. And I think I was, I was, I think I was kind of, it was understood that I would, I would, I would, I'd like to change things as I went, you know, if it felt, if it felt like it was more opportunity, you know, cause the concept artist would work on a concept for a week or two weeks or something. But I thought the way I figured is I was working on this thing for like a month. So over the course of that month, if I think of things or ideas that I want to put in there, I'll put them in there. Sometimes they were removed. Sometimes they, people didn't like it. Um, but oftentimes I was, I was given uh, the ability to kind of make those decisions. And certainly I'd have to make adjustments, especially the, near the beginning of an art creation of an art asset. I would check in with the art director very frequently so that I wouldn't have to st stop and go back seven steps and change this, you know? Um, but once the things are in place after the first like week or something like that, then it just becomes a question of, you know, consolidating forms and cleaning up forms and adding details and that kind of thing. Um, so I would try to figure out early if I was getting something wrong and then um, try to make those changes early. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, Adam Adomowicz was mm -hmm. the, the secret weapon at Bethesda. And you've done a lovely tribute to him on your website, which is cool. I highly advise people to check it out. But what was the number one thing you think you learned from him? Um, discipline, I think. Mm. Um, it Maybe the number one and two thing would be discipline and letting go of your ego. Um, we we're probably big ones. I think he was prolific. You know, he would, on the on the bus to work every day, he would sketch in his sketch pad. And then he'd spend all day sketching. And then he'd even often, oftentimes sketch during lunch. He wouldn't usually take time off just to hang out with people. Um, even though he was very, you know, personable, very sociable. And then he would work on the drive home. 
uh, on the on the bus home, and then he'd go to the gym and he'd then he'd eat dinner or whatever, and then he'd work on his personal projects. And I think I learned like, oh, if you want to be like good, like really good, you kind of have to be working on this all the time. And I think that was a wake up call for me because I think I was, I always had like kind of a more, I think because I started early and stuck with it earlier enough, drawing and art in general was always like came more more naturally to me. <laughs> But then I think seeing the way he worked made me realize that if I wanted to be not just good, but great, I'd have to just work my ass off all the time. And so, um, and I, and I especially appreciated the kind of letting go of your ego, you know, because when, when he would make some concept art, it was his job to make five pieces of concept art for every one piece of concept art they actually used, you know? And so all the time he was generating ideas and a lot of them were getting shot down and he just wouldn't stagger or anything he just keep on moving on and that was the job of a concept artist um and so i learned a lot about about creativity and the creative process um and what it took to be really really good from adam yeah well i suppose when it comes to creatives creatives naturally tend to have an ego so if you can let go of it it's a very good thing and yeah probably a bit more sensitive than maybe the average Joe as well. So like we, how long did it take you to really let the ego go? And was it like an instantaneous, instantaneous thing or did it take you a while before I, you stopped I mean, I don't know if taking I've, it on board? <laughs> I don't know if I, I don't know if I've gotten rid of my ego <laughs> per se. Um, well, is it but, better um, than it was before? It's like, yeah, in I terms, think, of, in I think terms it, of letting stuff go. Yeah, I think so. I think, um, you know, I would never, you know, like start a fit or whatever like that. But I, you know, you you get you get you fall in love with your own ideas, you know, um, and of because course, yeah. they're and because they're your ideas, they they are what you want to work on, you know, most. I think what helped me is understanding that I was part of a team, and that I was making art that was supposed to serve the larger function, and it had to belong in the game. And so I think that working in a you know environment in a team environment that was a production environment reminded me that after i make this art asset it's going to go to an animator and after that it's going to go into you know get plugged in, hooked up to ai and then designers will work with it etc cetera, etc cetera. recognizing that i was part of a process was helpful to me and recognizing that there has to be some top down control of the artistic vision um because that's how you make everything feel cohesive you know um in, if if you're playing a game and you can tell that like this one art asset doesn't really belong because of the color scheme and the shapes and maybe it looks more cartoonish than everything around you, it kind of drives you nuts. And so I think that recognizing that you're part of a vision, a larger vision, uh, helped a lot in terms of putting my ideas away. Also, I think that um, another thing I learned from Adam is you know study references a lot and try to derive derive ideas from there. And so every time I started a piece of art, I would ask Adam what he was looking at, or if it was a different concept artist, I'd ask them too, what it was they were looking at, what it was they were referencing as they made this this thing. And the whole idea there was to take their what to take what they were looking at and bring it onto my plate, so that I wasn't just inventing things out of my head, because then I'd be creating something kind of ultimately derivative and other ultimately rather samey, because we all tend to like as you know similar similar number of things. So I think recognizing that having other people's influences embedded into mine or even replacing mine would force me to work outside of my comfort zone, which would ultimately make me stronger and more capable and more well-rounded. Mm. Uh, yeah. You're probably aware of like all these layoffs that have been happening in the video game industry. Yeah. Bethesda seems to fly in the face of that. It's like one of the few Western studios where it seems to have a very high retention rate. Mm-hmm. Why do you think that is? I mean, you were there, you understand the culture. And there's been people, there's people that have been there for what, 15, 20 years? Long time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, definitely. I mean, longer than that, you know, 30 years. Um, it was, I think, quite well run. The, they were very shrewd. Um, the marketing department, you know, helped them put together quite a stockpile of money. They were relatively conservative, um, I think, uh, moving as they move forward. But then I think um, the guy who ran Bethesda, um, Robert Altman, who was married to Linda Carter, who used to be Wonder Woman, he passed away a couple of years ago. Um, 
he had empire building on on the on the brain you know like he he wanted to use the revenues from bethesda to acquire other studios like id and, and things like that and so i think it was recognized that it be, being one of the more successful and money-making game studios in their portfolio i think they recognized that um, i think there's a feeling that like there's a you know within the umbrella of bethesda games a lot of other they might jettison a lot of other companies with it under their umbrella before they get rid of, of Bethesda game studios, because Bethesda mm. was kind of like a, you know, where they put their big bucks, I think, you know, that and, and it, it, of course. Um, so there was, yeah, there's a certain stability there. I think their, the culture is, was, was, was really good for a while. You know, I, I haven't been there for a while, so I can't speak to the culture now. I know it's changed some, um, but you know, we all had a kitchen that we all ate, ate lunch at together. You know, we knew the chef. We knew the woman calling our names out when our food was ready. You know, um, there's a lot of team building, a lot of community building. And I think that played a huge hand into people staying for a while. I think mm -hmm. it was also the kind of place where, unfortunately, I think, you know, you could also, once you got there, you could kind of relax and not have to work that hard to keep your job. They don't fire people easily. You know, I think maybe they're leery of getting sued or something like that, but they're just, it's very, it's very hard to get fired, I think, at Bethesda. And um, so I think if there was, there was, you know, if, if you're not working that hard, but you're putting in your, your hours, you could just kind of do that forever. And I think that that's, has resulted a little bit in like some people who maybe, well, I won't go, I won't go that far. I, I just think it's very easy to go there and, and kind of cruise because you know, you're not going to lose your job um and so they'd be like that there'd be people like that at any company i think any company yeah any company yeah, absolutely yeah. i mean this it's it's a tale of as old as time it's just it's human nature yeah um but i think i think there's some people especially of the younger generation of at the time who i think worked really hard and poured their souls into the game but weren't necessarily recognized or or lauded over kind of everyone else to the degree where i think there was a, a feeling of like I think a lot of people who were kind of really pushing for change and for revolutionizing things and, and always moving forward, there wasn't, I don't know that people felt very supported in that environment. And so some of those people moved on and the people who, who, um, who didn't necessarily didn't have to put in all that time and just kind of, kind of get their head down, they could just stay. And so listen, what I'm saying is, is, is a broad, and rather ugly generalization, you know, it's verging, verging on slanderous, you know? And so I apologize in advance for like kind of coming off, you know, that way. But, you know, when you're in, when you're in a company, any company, any organization, and you feel change is happening and you're not happy with how kind of, you know, things are being handled in some respects, you kind of build up these small grudges, these kind of, you, you start to see the bad patterns and things. And so if, if you're hearing negative, negativity in my voice, it simply comes from the fact of just working there for years and not being entirely happy with how things, certain things were getting managed. And um, yeah, and you know, a lot of my colleagues have left since then, you know, and, and um, I think there is so much potential at that game studio. And there's a lot of new hires there who are young and hungry and, and, and amazing dreamers. And I really look forward to seeing what they do with Elder Scrolls six. I really cannot wait. Um, it's still a I long way away. <laughs> it's still a long, it's still a long way away. Exactly. And I think there's just a lot of people there who I remember who like didn't work that hard, who are just still there, you know, and who will never leave. And so I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. What was, what was sure. the dynamic? What was the dynamic you had with Todd Howard? Did you have much of a dynamic with him? Oh yeah, yeah. He's a very playful guy. Um, very charismatic guy. Yeah, he's charismatic. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to say. He he's a tricky guy to 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 navigate. You know, I I, I um, he is char he is very charismatic. But I think in many ways, you know, he, you know, if you're the guy in charge, you're a little bit of, you're you're alone. You know, like you're you it's you alone. You're the captain. You know, and so everybody can be tight with the captain. They can be loyal to the captain. It's hard to really be friends with the captain, because there's not because of yeah. of anything other than like he's authority. You know, and his word has to go. And I think that one thing that I felt really good about in the years while I was there, you know, and I, I only agreed with maybe sixty five percent of the decisions he made in general. 
But I think that's a very high batting average for a leader. I mean, think about like presidential approval numbers, right? Like, <laughs> you know, like when you have to make, when, you, when, when there's some guy at the top making all the decisions, like you're not going to agree with a lot of them. No. But I will, but I will say that I think me at the time of fallout and Skyrim and all that, I think there was a general feeling whether or not, whether or not you were angry at Todd or annoyed at Todd or whatever, I don't think there was ever any feeling like anybody else should be in charge. And I think that's a huge deal. That's a huge deal as I think that if, you know, I, I, I fundamentally knew that this was going to go well because Todd was in charge and that's a feeling of, of, of profound security, you know? So um, yeah, so he and I were great. We were, we've always been great. Um, and uh, I, the last time I saw him was at, 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 at my producer Angela's wedding actually. <laughs> <laughs> and he got, he got a little toasty and he told me that everybody there misses me. And if I wanted to come back, I can come back. Now, listen, this was years ago. So, you know, does the offer still stand? I don't know. I have no Who idea. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen him in like eight years or something like that. But, um, but yeah, no, he was great. Um, and he, he was always complimentary and, um, and supportive of my work. And, um, I only really got my, you know, my nose, like, you know, bopped by him, like once in any kind of significant way. And I deserved it. So, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, he is, you know, I, so I don't know, again, I don't know how things have gone now. I know the company's changed and it's gotten bigger and all these different things have happened. So I don't know. I'm not gonna, I can't speak to him, to him now, but at the time I worked with him, you know, I, I'll say this, when I got hired there, we had about like 54 people on the team. Small. It was very small. That's so I got tiny. to know him really, really well. Oh, yeah, it was tiny. By the time I left, it was only like 110. So it was still tiny. And so I think I got to know Todd, not at, if not, not at the beginning necessarily, at, by any stretch of the imagination, but it was still a small and intimate team where everyone knew each other. And so um, as the company has changed, I think his role within the company has changed. I think there's not probably that same sense of connectivity and everything. Um, and yeah and i wouldn't be surprised if maybe he felt you know a little sour about me leaving because i think when you're the guy in charge and you're trying to run things as well as you can and then you have some someone like me kind of tell tell him like i'm leaving you know like gotta go you know especially after a hit like skyrim i i, I gotta imagine you're feeling like if it was me i'd be like a little bit bitter i'd be like why you leave man like we had a good thing going you know yeah, and we yeah. did and we did have a good thing going we really did um we had a beautiful thing going uh, during the time I was there. Um, he, he would understand good... that, surely. I mean, you would have told him the yes. reasons as to why you're going. Of course. So there'd probably be a part of him that's bitter, but then a probably a probably another part Absolutely. that would understand. Yeah. Absolutely. No, no. I mean, when I told him I was leaving and taking a year off and 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 writing a fantasy novel and all that, he was like, "Dude, I want to do that." <laughs> <laughs> and it, I literally, and I looked at him. I literally, I said, "I said, I know, man, but you can't. <laughs> like, you are." <laughs> The you're guy. actually stuck here. Like you actually, you actually cannot leave at all. And so I think that he, I know, I think he really understood where I was coming from. I really, I think he really did. But you know, it's like, again, like he's stuck there. So, you know, why, why wouldn't he feel like, you know, well, I, if I'm stuck here, like you should, like we should be here together. You know, I work, you know, I think he works really hard to build this, build a team. I think over the years, it's hard to build a team and have people constantly leaking away at the edges and, you know, after a while, you start to feel, you know, I, I listen, I'm completely guessing as to his psychology. But again, I think it's I think it's lonely at the top, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. Did you have like a, a newfound appreciation for him once you went off and you worked on Fireborn? Was it Fireborn? Oh, yeah. 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 Fireborn. Fireborn. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, he. um, His ability to say no was one I wish I had embraced much earlier in, in, in the in the years afterwards yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i I, th I think i think building games like skyrim they seem limitless and, and fallout they seem limitless they seem huge they seem impossibly huge but actually like to do that to, to pull that off the guy at the top really has to say no a lot to a lot of ideas um to the point where it was frustrating and annoying and there's projects i worked on after hours just to get him in the game and by and large they got in the game which is great but it was very clear to me that i could not work on whatever I kind of dreamed up at that time at work all the time, because we had a game to get through and we had the fundamentals to hit. And so, um, yeah, certainly. I think, I think he had a very strong sense of what the games we were working on were and what they had to be and what they weren't and what they didn't have to be. And he would, he would very quickly say no to anything that didn't fit within that paradigm. And you'd th and that, 
by definition, de by definition, that's very limiting. But you know, uh, he had a great quote say, that it, that we went, went over a lot, which is, "We can do everything." I'm sorry, we can do anything, but we can't do everything. And so the idea is, it's a game. We can make the game do whatever we want, but we can we can only do a certain number of things. And so that that has stuck with me. I think, yeah, that that focus on the core experience um has stuck with me mm. i mean there's some concern i suppose that when the day comes when he hangs up the gloves so to speak like who will be yeah. able to take the mantle from him you know i agree i agree i mean i think you know i think at a certain point it, it you know i'm a big fan of changing up your career you know um as is evidenced by my ever-changing career <laughs> and so i think i think I think when the day comes for him to hang up his gloves, it'll be a good day. Not because he st doesn't still have it or whatever, but I think that like, you know, going from one game to the next to the next is exhausting. And if you have to helm that game and see it through every single step of the way, that's exhausting. So on the one hand, I'm like, dude, this dude is, this dude was born to do this. Mm. On the other hand, I'm like, I don't know. He's like 50 something at this point. And like, he's been doing this hardcore now for like, what 25 years like being not just working games but being at the helm of them you know yeah. um it's just it's it's you know I, I, and i think the day he hangs up his gloves there's going to be a lot of st stumbling and staggering by whoever reassumes that responsibility for sure mm. but um you know even if i was the guy who came up with the Elder Scrolls, you know, and like invented, you know, and then made Elder Scrolls games. After like Elder Scrolls, like three or whatever, I would just have to leave. <laughs> I'd be like, someone else do the, I'm all done. I can't, I, I got to pick it up. I got to do something completely different. Um, well, maybe that's but, why they know. alternate. That's why you alternated between Fallout and Elder Scrolls, yeah. right? So you don't oh, yeah. get, you don't find it too tedious. Well, I think, unfortunately, I think that may have been what happened between Fallout 4 and Fallout 76 is... Fallout 76 was a decision made near the top. I think maybe even outside of Todd's control, maybe. And it was like, let's, this Fallout thing has got legs. Let's keep it moving. And I, if, you know, if I'd been there from the Fallout 4 to Fallout 76 transition, I, 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 I think about this sometimes. I literally would have refused. I would have been like, no, I will work on Elder Scrolls 6 in secret for the next three years until the rest of the team is ready to move on to that. Because I can't keep doing dented metal and rusted out, you know, everything. And I can't keep doing irradiated monsters all the time. I want to make something beautiful. I want to make something wondrous. I want to, you know, give me, give me respite from like the same subject matter. Um, yeah. And the, and, the, and the other thing is, because games are taking longer to make, you'd actually be spending even more time working on it yeah. than previously. Yeah. No, I mean, being a game designer, it means measuring your life by projects. You know, you are, you only have like, you know, seven projects in you, you know, with each one taking like three years or whatever, you can only do that like a certain number of times before you're just old and you have to, you know, you have to stop working and maybe start dying soon because life's only so short, so short, you know what I mean? And so you only get so many, you know, cracks at a, at a, at these big projects, um, so certainly, yeah, with, with, with games getting bigger and bigger, you, you measure your life in terms of the projects you've created. Mm. What did yeah. you think of the uh, Fallout TV adaptation, by the way? Loved it. Yeah. Loved it. Brilliant, right? Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. I was really tickled by it. I think they did a really beautiful job. Um, I think Fallout is very hard to get right. A lot of people have tried. A lot of people can capture the general flavor of it, all these different things. There's a lot of aspects of it that people get. But I think if you're going to do a full-blown eight or 10 episode, whatever it was, arc, within the Fallout universe, and you're trying to layer by layer explain the world of Fallout, that which came before and how things are standing now, it's complicated. And I think they nailed it. They they, they got the politics of the 1950s, you know, like they really nailed the, the politics and like the worldview of like that, like imperialist America, the jingoism, the nationalism, the commercialism, the like highly militarized, you know, um, near dictator state of, of of america was brilliantly captured and effortlessly rendered i think the author the art direction was awesome um i thought that i really really appreciated that they, that they actually 
really cut down on the number of things they tried to cover. You know, no mention of super mutants. You know, the Enclave was simply mentioned and that was it. Um, lots of monsters they didn't show. Um, lots of places they didn't go. They really kept it to a, a certain number of core story principles. And I think that's why it succeeded is it didn't try to do everything. And I just loved it. And I think, I think also the last thing I'll say is that I felt as a developer and as somebody who has handled that material myself, I felt quite respected by the show because they just seemed to take entire art assets out of the games and putting them in the show. It was like, it was like they weren't trying to start from scratch and they weren't trying to invent their own thing. They loved the subject matter and they wanted to do justice to it and that showed. And so I am really grateful that these that the people who worked on that show did such a good job. Mm. Best video game adaptation of all time so far. By a mile. It might be. I, I think I, so. I, I think you may be right. I mean, I think there's an argument to be made for Last of Us, but I think Last of Us, it's almost- There was a, there was a direct translation. There was a, yeah, that was like a direct translation. That's exa exactly right. And beyond like the zombies themselves, like there, it was a pretty straightforward human story of survival. It wasn't like, you know, the the world of The Last of Us is not as dramatic and bold and strange and and, strange and uniquely defined as the world of Fallout. The world mm -hmm. of Fallout is a world. It's like a, you know, you're selling a place, a time, a feel, a, a humor and all these things. And um, they translated it beautifully into a mm -hmm. whole new story. I know we're going a little bit over time, but there were two questions I wanted to. That's all right. Let's do it. it. Okay. Uh, well, the first one is um, you've mentioned before that Bethesda doesn't really have an iconic art style, right? And hmm. it might, um, well, like a signature art style, I should say. Um, yeah. And that was brought on by the limitations of the engine. Um, but how hard is it to make a very signature art style? when you're using like realistic graphics as opposed to stylized graphics? Yeah, I think it's much harder. I think yeah. it's much harder to pull it off. Yeah, so when I say it doesn't have much of an art style, that's not a knock on Bethesda at all. No, generally what they go for so. is realism. Yeah, they, they generally go for realism. And so that's kind of the art style. Now, uh, you can talk about art direction and they have strong, they have strong art direction. Um, you know, the worlds they build are very con con convincing. The world of Fallout 3 is utterly unlike the world of, of Oblivion, even though they're used, they're made using the same engine more or less and all the same artists more or less, et cetera. But in terms of like art style, yeah, you look at something like uh, Dota or Diablo or, you know, basically any, you know, World of Warcraft game, um, there's, a, there's a much cleaner, more uh, slick style going on in games like Valorant and things like that, where it's very um, cartoonish and slick and, and, and bright and colorful. And, you know, um, so Bethesda does not embrace those kinds of styles, but again, those have a very particular aesthetic and they work within their own world. And so, yeah, I think, I think um, I certainly never felt like we had a set style per se. We were just trying to capture a world, I guess, in, you know? Yeah. Do you personally yeah. prefer realism or stylized? Um, in in my in, in I think I personally prefer realism, um, but I think that's that's because I it's it's like it's kind of all I know really. Um, I've tried to work I've tried to work really hard work working backwards on my own work trying to make it more. I'm always aiming to try to make it more simple and make it more stylized. Um, and I, I have only limited success um, because I, I'm kind of constantly trying to figure out how things are really working. And so... Um, well, I suppose you can have stylized realism as well. It's not like it's one yeah. or the other. Yeah. And I think that's I think that's what I how I would describe my game art personally is like a stylized realism where it's my I don't know what I don't even know how to describe my style per se. I'm it's me going for realism that's also like kind of hyper dramatic kind of. Um, but yeah, you can for sure you can. Yeah. And I think the best, you know, media and all that is exactly that. It's it's a realistic stylization. Yeah. Now, obviously, we have to talk about your fantasy novel, Quiet. Yeah. How did you come up with the yeah. name Quiet, by the way? Uh, good question. I'm not sure. Um, I think it came about because I had d done a lot of pictures of this small little skeleton. Um, and in the summer of 2020... Uh, when the world was terrible and everything, I decided I wanted to do like, um, 
kind of some kind of short form media that was very comforting, that felt like chicken soup for the soul. And so I made these um, videos called The Story of Quiet, in which I had this little skeleton named Quiet. Um, and the, the name just kind of fit, it, you know, it fit their very diminutive stature. It seemed to fit their personality. Um, and it just kind of clicked. And also his, it visually as a character, Quiet doesn't have, a, is a skeleton with no lower jaw. And, um, and the more I thought about it, the more I was like, well, I thought to myself, can they, can they even speak really? Um, so it started off as a kind of a nice name that kind of seemed to fit the mood of the character. And then since then, since I've created Quiet Level One, which is the graphic novel I'm working on at the moment, which is on Kickstarter, uh, I, once I really started digging into the story, I realized to myself, truly, actually, Quiet shouldn't be able to speak. And that seemed to me more interesting, actually, and more compelling than having them be able to speak um, because it adds a certain mystery. It adds a certain unusual quality. Um, you know, they're kind of a vaguely cartoonish looking skeleton. And there's lots of non-speaking characters in video games and this and that. But having this actually be a feature of their character um, seemed like a very interesting challenge to me, you know, where... I have my villain and he's monologuing and I have the villain's, you know, sidekick who's like a, this black knife with an eye in it. And he's always scheming and snarling about this or that. Mm. And then you have uh, Quiet's friend, the narrator worm, who is a small species of caterpillar who narrates everything from Quiet's perspective or the perspective of whoever it's with at the time. And then you have Quiet and Quiet is just silent and he speaks to you through uh, body language, acting, and action. Um, and I thought that was a kind of, a, that made it for a compelling centerpiece, I thought, you know, um, this, this small diminutive character who uh, can't even share to you their backstory, you know, it, who knows if their name is even quiet, you know, the, the, this is quiet is, end up what, quiet is what we end up calling them but they don't necessarily, you know, it's like one of those things where no, they don't actually even have a name. Mm. So, yeah. Did most of those ideas be there from the start or was it one of those things where it just evolved over time? The very first snapshot I got of Quiet was when I started doing this painting of a skeleton standing in a, in a dungeon. It was a small skeleton with a big belly and a really big noggin wearing old corroded armor holding a, a tiny little sword and ha having a torch. And the skeleton is looking around and it looks very unhappy. It looks scared. And the whole premise of the, of the, of the cartoon was like, what if like these undead skeleton warriors, what if there's a really small one who's afraid of the dark? You know, and that was kind of a cute, funny, silly little idea to me. And it started there, but really the idea of this little skeleton warrior or like skeleton century or whatever it is, came from the idea of, came from like Diablo 2, where I think about um, being the barbarian and storming into like, love, you know, the catacombs of level one and just walking around demolishing skeletons left and right. And these skeletons are too dumb to even attack you until you get right up close to them. They kind of just wander aimlessly. And I thought to myself, well, what if they were just chilling? What if they were just minding the damn business, you know, and, and you are the psychopath running down there, wrecking them one by one by one. And you're this, you know, the, when you play the, the 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 barbarian in Diablo, it's like a, it's designed to be a power trip, you know. It's it's he's basically just a, like a mech, you know. He just goes in and wrecks everything, and it's meant to make you feel powerful. And so I started thinking more and more about like, well, what if the villain of what if what if that hero is actually the villain? He thinks he's the hero, but he's the villain. He's Conan, but evil, right? And he's just like walking in and laying waste to these populations of creatures that like actually they're not evil at all they he just doesn't understand them and when it comes to like a skeleton like quiet like he couldn't even speak to quiet if he wanted to if he cared to you know and so i think the universe started life as this matchup of a level one skeleton versus a level 100 barbarian that is compelling to me because if the hero is the level one skeleton the question is how the hell are they going to win you know, like everyone knows a level one skeleton can't do crap against a level 100 barbarian. And so um, that's, but, they, but immediately that idea hooked me. And then from there, the, ne the next step was, you know, I had the who and I had the what, the two of them going up against each other. And 
the where was then the, the, the last big piece, which is the tree of worlds. And the tree of worlds is uh, something that we're familiar with from the tree of life, Yggdrasil from Norse mythology. Um, whether or not we're familiar with it intimately, we, we know the idea of you know a tree with all these kind of different worlds where different gods live in, uh, you know, in, the, in the trees. But I thought, well, what if you paired that with that video game idea so that you had these this tree of worlds, but it was divided into levels, level one, level two, level three, and every level is its own landscape, you know, with its own environment and its own bosses and treasures and NPCs and quest lines and all these things. But what is what, what if the goal then is for the, for the villain to get to the top and the hero has to stop him from getting to the top? Mm. Well, now we've come up with like the who, the what, and the where in a huge way. And so, you know, once I had the characters and I had the location, I immediately had a sense of, you know, the moment you see that tree with all the levels, you immediately are thinking progression, escalation, and, ex you know, uh, es escalation, you know, and even saying, calling it quiet level one, it's a promise. This is gonna go up from here. You know, this is only the beginning because this is a, you know, a journey. And, um, so those are the those are the fundamental pieces that that I think were there for a while, and then I've let the other pieces simmer for a while before before clicking into place. Mm. Well, I look forward to seeing it. You know, look forward to. I look forward to showing it. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> it's available on Kickstarter. That's right, um, and yep. everyone can keep track of it there, or I suppose on your social media feeds, and you got a YouTube channel and everything as well. Oh yeah, totally. I got a, I've got a, I'm, I'm posting about it on Instagram and on Twitter. Um, I've got um, videos on it um, on my YouTube channel and you, know, you should absolutely check it out. It's, it's, I'm pouring everything I have into it. All the work that I put into Skyrim and Fallout and all that tension and love that I put into those things, I'm putting into this, except even more so because this is my personal project. And <clears throat> we're about 10 days in, nine day, 10 days in, nine days in, and it's going great. We have uh, over 1,100 black backers. Um, we just hit 100,000 yesterday, so that means that the final product is getting upgraded. You know, more deluxe hardcovers. We're getting um, extra enamel pins for people at different levels. I'm working on the Tree of Worlds like world map right now. There's a lot of things going down, and it's very exciting. So yeah, if you're listening, come check it out. At least watch it for the trailer and see. Check out the trailer. is really good. Thank That's you. I'm a cool really, trailer. really yeah, pleased. yeah. Was that was that your idea, or did you work with someone else to bring bring that in terms of how you did the trailer? I did. I it it was my idea, um, and I worked closely with a couple other people. I worked with my friend from high school, this guy Tony, nice, and um, another guy named Jeffrey Palmer that I met kind of on Twitter. Who's <clears throat> he's he's really well known for animating Marvel, uh, not Marvel, um, magic cards, doing animations of magic cards. And they worked together to make the little trailer of Quiet Level One, the movie. And then I worked with a guy named Nathaniel Dotson, who I knew from my days streaming for Adobe. He runs tutvid.com, which is a, a tutorial video. And that's like a web website, a YouTube channel with a million and a half followers. He's awesome. And he met me at this movie theater in Pennsylvania to shoot um, the footage for the for the trailer um, or for the, for, the, for the Kickstarter video. And so it was really cool. It was very much a collaborative effort. I kind of had masterminded it, storyboarded everything out, but I worked closely with these other people. I listened to their feedback, you know, in some circumstances where I preferred, you know, these tracks over these tracks. I, you know, over the tracks chosen by my video editor, I was, I, I chose to let my video editor take the lead. Cause I'm like, you, like, I want you to be excited about this. I want this to feel good for you. And that's how, that's how I'm going to get the best out of you because you know, spoiler alert, when you're an independent artist, you don't have a lot of money to give out. <laughs> and so when you, when your friends agree to help you, you know, uh, out of the kindness of their heart, you know, you let them take the creative control they need to, to get the best out of them. So Fair enough. it was, um, it was great. I felt very supported. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jonah, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking time out of your afternoon. I suppose it's evening. There. You can, you can, you can go have some dinner now um yeah yeah thank you yeah. but i appreciate you doing this and uh all the best and uh i'll be keeping an eye out on quiet great Level one. thank you so much reese and thank you to everybody uh everybody listening yeah all right that is the show everyone make sure you share like and subscribe and uh, until next time stay safe